All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today from wherever you are streaming in from. Um, my name is David Lee. I'm the host for today's panel, illustrating queer experiences with our two lovely readers here, Stacey and Jillian. Before I like to start the event, I'd like to acknowledge that this festival takes place on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Sable-Tooth people. And there is a list of sponsors I must thank. But without their support, we would not be here in the capacity we are. Word Vancouver would like to take a moment to thank our generous donors and sponsors. We'd also like to take take a, take a moment to give a special thank to SFU and the Writer's Studio for this wonderful space and their continued generous supports of the festival. The sponsors um, are as follows, Canada Arts Council, the, the Canada Book Fund, the Canada Heritage Fund, Canada Periodical Fund, the BC Arts Council, BC Gaming, Creative BC, City of Vancouver, DBVIA, the Yosef Wask Family Foundation, the Hammer Foundation, the BC and Yukon Book Prizes, the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, CWILL, Pace and Associates, the Crime Writers Association, the Federation of BC Writers, the Surrey Library, the Vancouver Public Library, the League of Canadian Poets, the Writers Union of Canada, Vines Festival, and many more, believe it or not. <laughs> For a full list of our sponsors, please visit wordvancouver.com. Um, we're just gonna dive right into it so we can start talking about these lovely books. First off, reading, we have Stacey Chomiak. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us, Stacey. Stacey Chomiak is an artist, author, LGBTQ speaker, and art director in the animation industry. She got her start on the well-loved series, My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. While she continues to lend her talents to various children's animated shows, she also illustrates and writes kids' books for the queer community. Both Still Stace, My Gay Christian Coming of Age Story, and Rainbow Boy were published in 2021. She lives happily nestled amid the tall trees of the West Coast, not far from Vancouver. Stacy identifies as a gay Christian and loves to advocate for the LGBTQ community and have conversations around faith and sexuality. For more information, you can visit her website at stacychomiak.com. Please welcome Stacey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Give us a little reading. I, yes, then... I will. I will do a reading from Still Stace, my gay Christian coming of age story. And I guess I'll I'll show the illustrations. Some of them are small, but I'll, I'll show them anyway. I'm reading from uh, right in the middle, sort of, chapter 11, uh, fall 2002, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Look, it's snowing, I exclaimed, gazing out the window of the bookstore where Megan and I were absorbed in the art section. Wow, it's already snowed a lot. We should get going, hey? We headed toward my blazer in the parking lot, big soft flakes falling gently around us. It was dark and silent. The twinkling lights from the surrounding stores made the night feel enchanted. On a whim, I bent down quickly, scooped up some fresh snow and threw it at Megan. Hey, no fair, she laughed and quickly lobbed a snowball back at me. Here's the proof. <laughs> Almost photo photorealistic. <laughs> Soon we were hiding on either side of my car, trying to pelt each other with piles of soft flakes and laughing with glee. All right, all right, truce, Megan put her arms up. Time to get inside and warm up. I unlocked the car and we got in. I was breathless. Was it from our impromptu snowball fight or the rush of endorphins from being around Megan? Suddenly I had the most intense urge to lean over and kiss her. I quickly glanced at her. She was looking at me. No, Stace, don't do it. Remember Joanna? I fought against it, but it took every fiber of my being. I started the car and drove toward the house. That was close. I was in big trouble. After dropping Megan off, I drove home, buzzing from the feeling of being near her. But the further away I got, the more the Christian parts of me and my life came back into focus. I couldn't ignore this anymore. I felt like I was leading a double life. I was riding a slow moving train that was quickly gaining speed leaving behind Christian Central and heading right into the heart of lesbian town. <laughs> <laughs> We've been friends for almost two years now. If we kissed, I would definitely not be able to stop things. <laughs> then I would be stuck in sin again, like with Joanna. I had to stop it now, even if that meant throwing myself from this train. I started to panic. It was time for drastic Christian measures. <laughs> <laughs> I knew just who I had to tell. My older friend Rhonda from church. She wouldn't mince words. She would be brutally honest with me and help me find my way out of this suffocating lesbian fog. <laughs> Rhonda's house was always comfortable, but in that moment, I was incredibly uncomfortable. I wrapped my hands around my mug of tea, trying to gain some comfort from the heat. Admitting this to Rhonda wouldn't be easy. She could be blunt and tended to call things as she saw them. 
but it felt like the best chance to push myself back to the right path. So what's up, Stace? She looked at me with a big smile. I really didn't want to disappoint her. We'd known each other for years at Calvary Temple, and I looked up to her. She knew me as the silly one who tried to make people laugh and helped her lead Bible study. Now she searched my face, trying to figure out what was going on. I had to cut to the chase with her. Please, God, help me do this. Okay, so here's the thing. I, I don't know how or why, but I've been struggling with liking girls. I tried to sound calm. I kept my gaze on the floor as I forced the words out. If I looked at Rhonda's face, I knew I wouldn't be able to keep talking. It's been going on for about five years now, and no one really knows. I've been seeing a Christian counselor. I'm praying all the time, and I'm trying to be ex-gay. Tom from New Direction Ministries had been to our young adults group to share his ex-gay testimony, so the term was great gaining traction with my church community. However, I'm sure Rhonda never expected it to come out of my mouth. The reason I want to talk to you is because I met an older girl, a gay girl named Megan, and we've been hanging out. I shared my struggle with her, and I really like her. Nothing's happened, but I'm scared that something might, so I needed to tell someone. At this, I finally looked into Rhonda's face. Her eyebrows were raised in shock. Here's the illustration for the, the shock. Okay, wow, yeah, that's a lot, she said. Yeah, I'm sorry. A blanket of shame enveloped me. She immediately stood up to grab her Bible and quickly found them. Those verses from Pastor Gabe that I had been exhaustively studying for years. You know what these say, right? She spoke directly. Yeah, I know, I've been studying them, but like I said, it's been tough. But it's pretty black and white. It says homosexuality is wrong. Rhonda was not messing around. Maybe I shouldn't have told her. I, I guess it does. It's just, it's not that easy, I said quietly. This is not God's plan for you, Rhonda said seriously. I know, I'm sorry. I sank deeper into shame. I didn't know who to talk to. No, that's fine. I'm glad you came. I can definitely help you. I know what you need to do. She sounded sure. Oh, great. What? I asked. You need to sit down tonight and write a letter to this Megan. Tell her, sorry, you're not gay and you can't see her again. That friendship is obviously pulling you away from God and I'm here to help you cut it off, she said. That sentence launched a lead balloon in my chest that plummeted to the soles of my feet. Can't see her again. Cut it off. Oh, but what did I expect Rhonda to say? This was the absolute last thing I wanted to do. It had been almost two glorious years of hanging out with Megan. I desperately didn't want to let her go. I guess, I guess that makes sense, I said quietly. You agree, it's pulling you away from God, right? She is not helping her struggle. Rhonda's voice got louder. No, Megan's not helping my struggle for sure, I admitted. Okay, well, then you know what to do. Rhonda clapped her hands together. Problem solved. That night, I stared at a blank piece of paper, feeling absolute dread. I didn't know what to think to or do anymore, but Rhonda's confidence spurred me on. God must be speaking through her, so I just needed to follow through. I held my breath and mentally applied a thick layer of numbing salve to my feelings for Megan. I started writing. M. I'm sorry if I've given you the wrong idea, but I'm not gay. I just struggle with attraction to girls. I plan on getting married to a man once I figure this out because that's what God wants for me. I sat there filling the page with letters making up hollow words. The Christian part of me felt I had to write, but not the ones that were true. Deep down, I realized something tragic. I had let myself fall in love with her all the more reason to end it. I had to believe that God would reward me for doing this, the right thing. This was a massive step toward the right path. One foot in front of the other. Stace, you can do this. There's a little tiny picture of me writing the, <laughs> the forbidden letter. I pulled up to Megan's house, clutching my handwritten letter tightly. As I rolled to a stop, I realized my heart was beating so loud I couldn't hear anything else. Am I about to do the right thing? or the wrong thing. No, I need to do this. Being around Megan was too mind boggling. I couldn't keep control. I couldn't trust myself. I cared too much, too intensely. 
I wanted too many romantic things. I need to cut this off. I took a deep breath and stepped out onto the crunchy patches of snow that spotted the road. I looked up at the beautiful trees that lined her street, their late fall beauty cheering me on. Let's do this. Back to the right path. Hey, Stace, come on in. I have coffee brewing. How's it going? Megan said brightly. Her light and easy way of being around me tore me apart. I could see how happy she was to see me, and it felt amazing. And now, on this perfectly wonderful day, sharing this fuzzy magnetic air, I was going to ruin it. Hey, yeah, yeah, sure, thanks, yeah. Yeah, good, I managed. I was trying so hard to be my cheerful self, but my voice was strained. She must have heard it too. Do I give her the letter or not? Standing in her dizzying presence, I could feel the true weight of this sinking in. Megan poured coffee into two mugs and turned to look at me. Hey, are you, are you okay? She asked. Yeah, yeah, I stammered, avoiding her captivating eyes. Right path, right path, right path. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I forced the words out. I, I have this letter for you. Oh, Megan glanced toward the crumply piece of paper in my hand. Okay, let me get my glasses. Is that a tinge of excitement in her voice? Does she expect me to confess my true feelings for her? Has she known this whole time? Suddenly, I felt desperate. Why couldn't I have written that letter? I knew I had to turn off my emotions in order to move forward. I followed her down the hallway into her cozy living room flooded with early afternoon sun. We'd spent many hours in here talking, watching movies, sharing meals. It was beginning to feel like a second home to me. This little piece of paper was about to end all that. I handed her the letter. She looked up at me once more, the beauty of her face taunting me to forget everything. I don't have to read this, she said, holding it out in front of her. She could sense my intense anxiety. She was trying to give me a way out. I wanted to snatch the letter from her and plead, no, please don't read it. It's full of lies. I love you. I wanted so badly to grab her and kiss her and tell her how I felt, but I knew it was a struggle talking. I have to be strong, I have to. I heard my voice respond as if it was coming from outside my body. No, you have to read it. Okay, she said slowly unfolding the letter. I wanted to die. I wanted the earth to so swallow up, open up and swallow me. This horror was unfolding in slow motion. I studied Megan's face like I had done way back in the computer lab. I watched her gorgeous eyes travel back and forth as she read my empty confessions. The lightness and joy drained from her face. I could feel her begin to build up a wall right in front of me. Silently, she finished reading, slowly folded the letter and handed it back to me. Her eyes revealed a deep sense of betrayal. You're giving it back to me? I was numb. I don't need it. She said coolly, that's it. I had broken her trust. I had lied to her. I said I wasn't gay. I had said I wasn't like her. Am I? Aren't I? There was nothing more to be said. I grabbed the letter, stood up and threw it in the garbage. As I walked out of the room, Megan followed me silently down the hallway. We both knew I needed to leave. This was the last time I would be welcome in her house. I wanted to dig my heels in, kicking and screaming. I was holding back this dam of heartbreak with all my strength, feeling it about to burst any second. But the hard part was over. I did what God wanted. I ended it. My body felt monumentally heavier as I walked back to my car, a dull ache numbing everything. Maybe if I got away from Megan's house, her enticing world, her intoxicating presence, I would start to feel lighter. As the physical distance grew between us, my heart throbbed painfully. I had to pull over. The ache was overwhelming. What have I done? When I finally got home, I turned on my computer to check my email and my heart stopped. Megan's name popped up. S, you'll never know how close you came. M. I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you so much for that reading. One thing I realized, um, and I think you guys will feel it too, it's very, it's a different experience hearing authors read their children's books and or YA books. It's, 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 it reminds you of why they're so important, I think. 
Mm-hmm. This was magical. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Stacey, so I know I, I really like how you have this background in animation, mm. and I wanted to know more about kind of how that influenced um, you bringing this book to life. Um, if you guys haven't seen it or picked it up yet, um, you should today. It's very gorgeously illustrated, and I want to know how, how much your background in animation influenced him making this book. Yeah, I mean, it, it did in, in a huge amount of ways because it, obviously in animation, I work mostly in the design department. And so everything's, you know, designed and characters are designed and the locations are designed. So I felt like after working in this industry for over 10 years that that I could feel confident enough to design a version of myself, yeah. which I, I never really thought about before. But um, that's sort of, I think, that background and that mm-hmm. gave me sort of the confidence to tackle it and, and then be able to sort of think about how am I going to visually translate all of these things that happened to me and, and how would that translate best to an audience? And I think without having um, the experience of animation, that mm-hmm. would have been a lot harder to, to figure out. Mm-hmm. Did you find it um, harder than you thought or was some parts a bit easier? Uh, <laughs> it was emotionally harder than I thought yeah. because, um, I mean, you know, I've worked obviously on lots of productions that I don't have personal attachments to. And, yeah. So this, uh, every single personal attachment to this, and and a lot of it was very painful. And um, mm-hmm. me and the editor sort of chose the moments that would be the most impactful, which usually are the most painful. So mm-hmm. to sort of go in and, and dredge up the, you know, how that would look visually was was really emotionally taxing. Yeah. I didn't expect that, actually. Well, it came out really beautifully. Thank it's you. It's a really pretty book. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, one other question I had was, um, I just find the whole genre of YA illustrated memoirs is very... Um, not, when I grew up, when I was reading, I don't think there were many illustrated YA yeah. memoirs. Yeah. So I wanted to know what were what did you look for to for inspiration for creating this, and like what yeah. were they lacking that you wanted to represent in your illustrated memoir? Yeah, that's a great question, and that was actually uh, there was a ton of research behind that with with my agent, with myself, and with the publishing right. uh, company that that did the book deal because they're actually that was partially why we got the book deal is there actually wasn't really many or any YA queer illustrated books with a faith background. Mm-hmm. So we did look at uh, quite a few like YA uh, novels and then some graphic novels and right. mine was sort of fell in the middle. So we looked at like Spinning and Bloom and uh, Brave Face, a lot of the ones that had sort of queer and then some that had faith aspects. Mm-hmm. And the thing that they liked and that and that I like personally about obviously my own story, which is <laughs> it's my, just my story, is the sort of ability to have have um, space for both, you know, yeah. the faith and sexuality, because often stories of, of queer people that come from faith backgrounds, there's just so much pain and hurt, and that, that makes so much sense, mm-hmm. but often they have to leave behind the faith aspect, yeah. and with my story, I was able to sort of reconcile the two, and I think it's important to have that also on the shelves mm-hmm. for people to, to read about. Yeah, it's a perspective that otherwise they wouldn't find out about, right? And Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's really important. Uh, thank you so much. We'll come back with questions for the group as a whole, but thank I'm you. excited to introduce our next reader. <laughs> <laughs> this is Jillian Christmas. Jillian Christmas is a queer Afro-Caribbean writer living on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam people, colloquially known as Vancouver, BC, where she works as a speaker coordinator at Cicely Blaine Consulting and served for six years as artistic director of Versus Festival of Words. She has won numerous Grand Poetry Slam championship, t- championship titles and represented both Toronto and Vancouver at 11 national poetry events, notably breaking ground as the first Canadian to perform on the final stage of the Women of the World Poetry Slam. She has presented poetry and theory in a multitude of venues, including the BC Civil Liberties Gala, the SFU 2018 Grad Conference closing keynote, and numerous panels focused on the intersections of critical race theory and contemporary art. Please welcome Jillian Christmas, reading from the next show. First of all, you're so cool. Um, (laughs) I was listening to your bio, I'm like, oh my god, my little pony, are you kidding me right now? Right? That's so great. And then also, like, hearing you read this, oh my gosh, I was having all these flashbacks to my childhood, my gay Christian childhood. (laughs) Um, It was, it's really spectacular yeah thank you um so my book is the magic shell it's a picture book um and i'm just gonna dive in it was illustrated by diana mungary and um she did an amazing job i'm really happy with what she created so um i'll just read until i have to stop (laughs) do you feel yeah until i feel like stopping 
It's busy. <laughs> okay, let's try that again. So um, our our main character is Little Pigeon P, and you'll you'll get to adventure with them. It's busy living in Mama's kitchen, and everyone's got something to do. Mama is rolling the roti, and Daddy is stirring the callaloo. Auntie and her sweetheart June are setting the table just right, and everyone is excited for the feast we will all share in tonight. Even though I know they would all like to play, they're busy as can be, and the only one who has nothing to do is Pigeon Pea. That's me. Mm -hmm. I've sorted my toys and I've done all my homework. I even cleaned under my bed. And all the while, whatever I do, questions keep popping into my head. Oops, oh, there it is. Like who is grandma's grandma? And where did she live and play? And if she was here with us right now, what do you think she would say? And, and after a string of wild questions, Auntie stops and crouches down low, her face dizzy with answers. Her cheeks are sweet as plump mango. Um, Auntie also has some great earrings on. She does. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not gonna miss the details. <laughs> no. My dearest darling, my pigeon pea, I can tell you've got lots on your mind but some of the answers you're seeking are ones that only you can find. Our family traveled a very long way and I'm sure they are guiding us now. And if you'd like to meet them and ask them yourself, I think I can show you how. And don't you worry about getting lost because you're never traveling alone. Your ancestors are always with you and they can always guide you home. Then auntie asked a delightful question. Well, would you like to go see? And I bounced up and down and I nodded yes as Auntie giggled at me. You can see Auntie Sweetheart June is having a lovely time witnessing this show. <laughs> yes, she's like, oh my God, cute. <laughs> Probably like first dinner with yeah. the family, you know. Um, in an instant, she fished through her pocket, rummaging and pushing about. And in just another moment, her cupped hands came up and out. Slowly, she lowered her hands to my eyes and I followed down like a spell. Then she opened her fingers one by one, and in the center of her palm lay a shell. <laughs> a cowrie shell, she whispered, placing the treasure in my hands. It carries the stories of our people across seas and distant lands. And if you listen very close and you hold it very near, there's a magic inside this little shell that might just take you there. A magic shell so perfect it could travel me all the way home. A magic spell of protection so I never have to go alone. I held the cowrie in my hand and I squeezed it ever so tight and I closed my eyes and I listened and I remembered with all of my might. And suddenly the sound of the ocean and birds calling out like a bell tumbled out of the open mouth of my magical cowrie shell I opened one eye very slowly to be sure I was still sound and safe, and Auntie was there with a smile and one curious eyebrow raised. And everything was a buzz just like before, and everything was just in its place. So I cozied up under the table and said, okay, adventure awaits. <laughs> I've never before held a magical shell, but somehow I knew just what to say. And as Auntie looked on with a smile and a nod, we both whispered one magic word, Ashe. I'll tell you more about that word later. <laughs> this is my favorite page. Tightly I closed my eyes and gripped the shell in my hand and quieted all of my thoughts and suddenly felt the sand, soft between my toes as if it were in the room with me. When I opened my eyes once more, I was standing beside the big sea. As you can tell, Pigeon Pea is also a fashion icon. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Today, I learned that my heart can remember a place I have never been. Tobago, I said with surprise as the word materialized like a dream. And crossing the beach toward me was a woman that looked almost like me, with a smile on her face and flowers in her hair and a voice that sounds like the sea. A face my heart can recall. Great, great, great grandmother, is it true? 
I knew you would recognize me, sweet pigeon pea, just as I recognized you. Then we walked together and laughed, passing colorful homes along the shore until we reached a big celebration with delicious smells and drums and more. Mm. <laughs> it's a celebration of love, she said, as we walked closer along the sand and we gather together to witness their love and their joy as they join hands. So we watched and danced for a long time to the drums that sang from the sands. Then we both looked down at the very same moment at the shell I still held in my hand. Looks like you've got more family to meet, I heard great, great, great grandma say. <laughs> Then we both smiled as I squeezed my shell, closed my eyes, and whispered, Ashe. You guys can whisper with me if you like when that comes around. <laughs> when my eyes opened again, I was on the same beach, but it wasn't a ceremony at all. It seemed as though I traveled further behind, and this time there were no houses, big or small. But beautiful handmade boats bobbing at the water's edge where people were pulling in nets. Yes, I know these faces too, Kalinago people, my family, and now I can never forget. There were people of every size and shape in bodies of infinite kinds, some singing, some pulling and untangling nets in rhythm and in time. The fishing boats have all come in, come help us prepare the meal. And in an instant, I felt welcome and I sat and I began to peel, sepals to prepare the hibiscus, like I had seen auntie do. We're about to make sorrel pigeon pea and it will be nicer with help from you. So I stayed for a while watching the harvest from sea and from the shore and my belly began to rumble as the song swelled more and more. In a, it's slow business preparing all of this food for a meal I know will be great, but I have one more stop to make before dinner and I really don't wanna be late. So I finished my task and I smiled to the crowd of my loving Kalinago kin. And I waved them goodbye as I squeezed my shell tight, closed my eyes and said, Ashe again. This time I've landed across the seas on a beautiful West African shore. And every sight that my eyes take in makes me certain I've been here before. There are relatives in flowing garments of every color I've ever seen and Arisha's beautiful and beautiful forms as fluid as air, transforming however they need. My divine ancestors are with them and the spirit guides of my family too. And each one is smiling and saying, we're so happy to finally meet you. And would you believe it? Everyone is here. Great, 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 great grandma <laughs> and all the others as well. <laughs> Every song they teach me is full of love and every dance feels like a spell. We've all been loving you for a long while, Yamoya says, as they gesture with a hand. This is your home and it's always inside of you, no matter where you stand. And out of the mist and the sunshine come others singing and dancing and free. Each stops and waves as we approach and each of them looks a little like me. There are so many hearts that love you, my darling, and each of them plays a part in this sacred line of connection that leads back to the very start. We walk through the sand and the laughter and the songs like the swaying trees. You wouldn't believe it, but each person we pass is smiling and cheering for me. We are always rooting for you. We are with you wherever you are. So if you're ever feeling lonely, you can call on your family we are never far. And in that moment, I heard a bell ring and caught a yummy smell coming in with the breeze. <laughs> Auntie's voice, dinner is ready, get it hot, callaloo and fresh roti. Well, don't forget to save us a plate, said a voice that swayed like the sea. That kitchen sure does smell real sweet and your ancestors love to eat. And with a laugh, I squeezed my eyes closed tight and held the shell very near. Ashe, I whispered, and when I opened my eyes, my auntie's face was there. Looks like you've been adventuring, little pigeon pea. Did you learn anything new? Come tell us the story. The table is set, and all we need is you. 
Then we gathered round the table full of treats and sweets and daddy said, daddy asked, would anyone like to pray? Then we all looked around at our family and our feast and in one breath, we each said, Ashe. Yeah. <laughs> and you can see all the ancestors joining them for the meal. <laughs> and that's the end. A little pigeon piece first adventure. Thank you so much. Thank you for I think it's next turn is like a really cute, intimate story time. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Um, it's so nice to be able to read it aloud. This wasn't on my question list, but mm -hmm. um, let's talk about Ashe. Ashe, yeah. yes. So yeah. in the back of the book, you'll see, because um, I, you know, my ancestry is West African by way of the Caribbean, by way of, hmm. unfortunately, the trauma of, um, you know, chattel slavery. And so, um, so many of the pieces that I wanted to bring um, to the forefront in this are pieces that often are kind of um, left behind in that disconnection. Yeah. Yeah. And so I really wanted Little Pigeon Pea to be able to find all of those pieces and, and feel celebrated. And so I pulled in some of the words from the Yoruba language. Um, and that is um, one of the languages of the now Nigerian people on the Western coast of Africa. Um, and so in Yoruba, Ashe means um, like the power in the universe to make something happen. It also means like uh, like thank you to the universe. It, it's almost like amen. Like if you were to say like a prayer at the end, you would say ashe, mm -hmm. you know? Um, or like if someone was giving thanks, you would say ashe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, and then there's all in the back of the book, I was lucky enough to be able to include a glossary yeah. because even though this is very specific to my um, ancestry and I wanted it to speak really directly to like Afro-Caribbean mm -hmm. children, I also wanted it to be something that could feel accessible to everyone in like thinking about their ancestors and so things that maybe they might even be able to relate to. So I did give a little glossary of some of the foods, some of the, the words that show up like Kalanago and Ashe and Orishas and Yamoya mm. that might be unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. yeah. So magical. Yeah. Um, There's I a lot of magic. Yeah. Yeah. Pigeon P just time traveling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yes. I want to talk a little bit more about kind of magical aspect of it. I, I am a sucker for just any magical aspect yeah. of a story. And um, I think it was just so clever and just so cool to have this magical cowrie shell. Mm -hmm. I want to know how did you end up deciding on using a cowrie shell? Mm. I've probably many things. <laughs> you know, yeah. And if the symbol or the image kind of changed from when it was first conceived to when it was in the book? It was actually always a cowrie shell. Okay. Um, and I have some here actually mm -hmm. with me, but um, these ones come uh, from Nigeria, from the West African shore. Uh, I got to collect them while I was on some travels to Tanzania and about mm -hmm. um, earlier this year. And the cowrie shell, um, as you may or may not know, uh, is really, um, it's kind of like, it's got uh, a huge like iconography in uh, African culture. Um, it at one time was used as currency and trade. Um, it, it's been used to adorn, you know, Egyptian, um, you know, royalty and, and royalty across the continent um, since I think like, the beginning mm. of storytelling, yeah. you know? And so there's lots of beautiful images of um, black beauty that uh, you'll see people adorned with cowries in jewelry mm. in their hair. Um, and so it felt really fitting because uh, while the cowrie exists on the continent, it also exists in a lot of the places of the diaspora mm -hmm. where those people um, reside now who, who were transported. So. Um, yeah, it felt like a really wonderful tie. I mean, I always have loved the magic of like, I remember being a small child and my dad telling me to like put my ear to a yeah. shell and like hearing the ocean, you know? And yeah, the oceans and, and water are so a part of the migration. Um, and so it felt also very fitting to, um, to have the symbol be of the seas. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, there were so many reasons why I think the cowrie was like speaking to me. Uh, but one of them was when I was writing my first book, which is a book of poetry, yeah. um, The Gospel of Breaking, mm -hmm. I went to the Banff Center uh, to finish writing it. And um, 
my mentor there was uh, Tanya Evanson, who's an incredible writer. If you haven't read her work, you definitely should. Um, and she has done some travels around the continent, which also show up in her writing. Um, and in a ceremony that she led uh, as she was kind of welcoming us all, she gave each of us a cowrie oh, shell. Wow. And mine, the one that she gave me still sits in my, this little like travel altar that I carry yeah. with me everywhere mm -hmm. that I go whenever I'm on the road. Wow. So I thought it was a nice thing. And also, you know, it's become really um, wonderful for me because I collected some while I was, like I said, while I was on the continent. And now whenever I read the book to children and specifically my nibblings who it's dedicated to, I give them a cowrie shell oh, when I read it to oh. them as well. So it's a large cowrie shell. <laughs> I mean, I got like 40 and I'm like, I have to like, I, I'm going to be like, now it's going to be like groups of children. Yeah. Cause you're one cowrie share. shell to share. Yeah. No, I'm sure, I'll, I'm sure I'll have to get in touch with someone to send yeah. you some more. Yeah. Um, I also want to ask, um, I've known you through your poetry. Mm -hmm. gonna, and like I said earlier, it's very different hearing um, ch children books authors read their book, there's such a melody and a cadence mm -hmm. and a rhythm mm -hmm. to reading. Mm -hmm. How does being a poet influence mm -hmm. your creation of a picture book? Because you hear poets moving from poetry to fiction, poetry mm -hmm. to short story, poets to children's picture book. Yeah, I think it's, mm -hmm. it's cool. I thought it was really cool. You know, I also think um, maybe in hindsight, there was something very clever in it that I didn't <laughs> anticipate. But like, uh, you know, I think after releasing uh, any kind of book that is not a children's book, I think there's often this expectation of like, oh, what's gonna come next? Is mm. it gonna be as good as the other? Is it, <laughs> is it like gonna have the critical acclaim yeah. or whatever, you know? And I think I sort of dispelled that. I think the magic shell helped me like let go of that. I was just like, like oh. it's a children's book and I literally don't care what you think about it. Yeah. So <laughs> also, it's my story. So, <laughs> you know, there's some also freedom in writing yeah. your story and like being like, it's not, actually up for debate it's like this is what yeah. um but uh i i also think that like poetry exists really like seamlessly in children's mm -hmm. writing you know like having end rhyme as mm -hmm. which is actually something i don't use very often in my well, other poetry I was gonna say yeah it's not i there. i very specifically don't use end rhyme yeah. in my other poetry because um yeah i i most of my other poetry is written for like you know teen and up yeah. audience. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for that age range, what actually keeps people interested if you do include rhyme is like internal rhyme, mm -hmm. um, you know, rhymes that are not predictable. Yeah, but subtle. when you're from like four to nine, what is what keeps a, a child, I think, into the story is mm -hmm. that rhythm and that rhyme and that like, oh, wait, are they going to say this or that, you know, like that guessing is part of the learning process. I think mm -hmm. the development of our brains as well. Like, mm -hmm. um, so that felt really important to me, yeah. but it was actually um, my publisher for the children's work um, is Flamingo Rampant in yeah. Toronto, which like best, most beautiful, like gay kids press <laughs> out there. Um, and uh, I had contributed to an anthology, which was Power Poems for Little or for Small Humans. I always oh, forget it. Is it Power Poems for Little Ones or Small? <laughs> anyway, it's Power Poems. They were meant to be like, um, kind of like, uh, not uh, yeah, I guess like nursery rhymes yeah. for kids, but like mm -hmm. that we're teaching them something that they could use in the world, you know. And so mine was a poem about anger, on honoring yeah. anger, mm -hmm. and and how anger moves through our bodies and what it's for. And um, it, mm -hmm. I kind of released it into the world um, in 2020. Uh, I recorded a video of it that um, I think it made a lot of rounds. Like it was quite. Um, I, I guess, I don't know what it takes to call something viral. I don't think it was quite viral, but it, it, it traveled far and wide. And um, uh, yeah, and it was just a way for the children, I think, especially black children who were witnessing a lot of like bizarre, yeah. you know, treatment yeah. of black bodies um, to allow them to process their anger. And so I think that really, like it uh, sort of, brought to the forefront for me, like how poetry um, in younger writing can like create a, a, a container for that mm -hmm. kind of learning. A framework. Know? Yeah, a framework, to exactly. what they're seeing. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. And then when they step out of that yeah. particular rhythm, it's like mm -hmm. they leave that behind, mm -hmm. yeah. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love that answer because for anybody who ever asks me like, 
what's poetry good for. Yeah. There you go. Lots of things. So I can tell you a couple things yeah. poetry's good for. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. And I love hearing you guys read. And thank you so much. Um, we're going to move on to just questions for both of you. And if anybody else has questions, feel free to just, um, uh, yeah, we can take questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, some questions I was wondering, um, what your book is it based on your own personal experiences? Uh, based on personal experiences. Yes, personal uh, question was if the book was based on your personal experiences. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's fully, um, fully my to the best of my memory, um, very accurately my my personal experiences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question for those at home is, uh, was Stacey ever able to reconcile um, coming out and, and still being Christian? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I, I, I definitely am. Um, today, I, I have peace with both. And uh, I'm really, I, I'm really excited to actually to sort of straddle both communities and, and have a lot of conversations, not just about Christianity, but just mm -hmm. about a lot of faiths and, and how the, they intersect with, uh, you know, queer people and, and how much people actually want to talk about that. It's, yeah. it's been really surprising, actually. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, it's a complicated thing. Faith. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you for those questions. I want to ask both of you. Um, how do you feel picture books or books for young readers mm -hmm. um, have changed in the last few years and how they speak about queerness and how they present mm -hmm. it to younger readers? Because mm -hmm. growing up, I didn't get a lot of books. Mm -hmm. that, um, I literally I want books like never this. saw a book about queerness yeah. when I was growing up. Like, yeah. I, I'm like, is that true? Yeah, I don't think I right? ever yeah. saw a book about or that involved queerness. Yes. I read like in any way. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I like I'm a child of the '80s, so I think like at the time they were still like, like even like having queerness and children in the same oh, like yeah. like Never. conceptual space was yeah. like, oh, that's pretty. Different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's yeah. like okay. Um, yes, yeah, I feel like yeah. Do you feel like there's more? If it's going. Okay, yeah, I mean, I think undoubtedly there's a lot more representation mm -hmm. um, and. Yeah, I mean, that, that's because of the work of people who have, like, tried to create that space and um, and continue to create that space. And, I mean, I think it's, like, the kind of thing that we have to be really vigilant about, like, continuing right. to, to um, foster. Mm -hmm. I think about, like, so many of the laws have, <laughs> popping off in the States <laughs> right now. And, like, I, like, honestly, like, I have this sense that, like, RuPaul's Drag Race in like five years is going to be like banned from TV yeah, or something like that. And, and it, you know, it's just like, um, yeah, as much progress as we make, um, there is always a force That's pushing taken, yeah. us back. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think it's incredibly important. And one of the things that I love about um, Flamingo Rampant, as far as like picture books go, um, they have a mandate uh, in their publishing house that they, they only publish stories of celebration um oh. which i thought was like so cool like you yeah. know there were a lot of i think i could have taken the the book or the story elsewhere um and i think yeah. you know uh i just love their press so much because of that because every book that comes out of their press is going to be a joy story for yeah. some child and like and it also challenged me like you know i want to deliver this route to ancestry for the little ones that i read yeah. for and I want to be able to do that and circumnavigate the trauma stories that are yeah. mm. that are a part of the history, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, because I don't think that should be the first introduction that like little black children totally. have to yeah. their to their culture, which I mean, it definitely was for me like in school, mm. they're just like, so the history of black people it's and it this. starts at slavery. Yeah. And it's like, wait, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like there was some stuff before that, <laughs> like, you know, um, <laughs> literally. And so, yeah, I my hope was just to create um, a pathway to that. Um, and and so it was really aligned with yeah. Flamingo Rampant's mm -hmm. mandate. And yeah. I think that felt it really beautiful. It does that beautifully. And mm -hmm. literally, Vision goes back in time, yeah. past those entryways that exactly. we have been introduced yeah. to. Like, and there's yeah. no like 
contact. Exactly. Right? Like, you know, there's just like. It's a celebratory story. Imagine a world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. What about um, for like faith-based stories? Yeah. Like, I, do you see them changing now? Or? Yeah, that's a whole. <laughs> I have a lot more to say on this subject as well because there just isn't, I mean, it's all about representation. Yeah. Right? There's not enough about this conversation of, of like queer people. I mean, when I was growing up, there was white Jesus and there was homosexuality and they, you know, <laughs> they did never meet. Never so. the two shall meet. No, no. And, and even still, I mean, I just heard that my book got banned on some, some like kind oh of- Oh my gosh, dis- congratulations. Thank you. Oh, Real oh, oh, Can we just take a moment? Yeah, <laughs> we we should be like, <laughs> honestly, there should be like a gay award for there that. Like know. Lambda should add like a, you oh got banned. <laughs> We have a band author. Oh my god. Honestly, like that's street cred, right? <laughs> 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 I do, yeah. Ooh. I just think, I mean, having the, the gay Christian in the film yeah. is, yeah. is stirs the pot, which I kind of love. But, but that's totally that's the supposed whole to point. do. That's right? the whole it's, point. Yeah. And then, I mean, I thought by the time this would actually be published that it would be sort of redundant and unnecessary. And right. yet when it came out in, you know, a few months ago, I, I still get emails with people, even just like in the Southern States, they're like, I never knew this was possible. Oh, I never, I, yeah. And it like, like life changing, you know, stuff. So yeah. it just shows me like, there's so much more in need for this mm-hmm. conversation and these sort of celebratory stories mm-hmm. of just like queer kids and, and what that feels like and mm-hmm. what that looks like. And, and that's mm-hmm. so important. Oh, you guys are doing such good work. Oh, we have, oh, we have a band author. I, <laughs> I honestly can't. Like, it's wild to me because, like, if it was just like my Christian coming of age yeah. story, uh, it would have been like, totally. well, that's the thing. It's, you know, but yeah. like, slip totally. that those three letters in there, and yes, uh, yep. it changes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we have one time. I want to hear your answers to kind of one more question yeah. here. Um, so, what do you think books for younger readers can do in platforming queerness that can otherwise be shown in genres like poetry, fiction, or books for older readers? Mm. Like, why is it important for them to see it in kind of illustrated books? Oh, I mean, I can jump in. I, yeah. I just, because I, I mean, I'm an artist first and, yeah. and sort of a new new author, but I I'm, I love writing. But I just feel like it, I have two young kids and mm. obviously they're very visual and they don't necessarily care about the words as much, yeah. but they love to see things. And I just think it's so important to be able to see like, you know, I did a, an illustrated book called Rainbow Boy, and it's about a boy who, like, wears tutus and plays <laughs> with dolls. And it's just it's just important for my kids to be able to pick that up and say, like, oh, yeah, like, it's okay for my son to wear a tutu yeah. and see that in a book. Like, that is just so important <laughs> because all the media out there, visually, in animation and kids' books, often doesn't have that. It's very, like, gender norms. Yeah. So I just think that there's just, again, there's so much more work to be done with, with showing, like, with racially right. and all of those things. Things that that can be visually represented that yeah. aren't out there mm-hmm. enough. Yeah, it's a good point of bringing up how it's shown in visual media, and I feel mm-hmm. like the times it's it's getting better now. But I feel like there's times we were watching those kids shows. I have younger cousins, and they're always watching these kids. Yes. Mm-hmm. and it's the the queerness is there. It's just discreet. Almost. Yes, they oh, don't yeah. really want to do it. Coded. Yeah, but they're yeah. kind of together. Yeah. Yeah. but they're not together. Yeah. <laughs> but they're yeah. together. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. totally. I can't it's wait. It's like the Teletubbies. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're like. <laughs> Cole was so gay. What's the dynamic here? <laughs> um, yeah. Do you have anything to add about visual representation? Yeah. Or... You know, I mean, I think I, I was told just the other day, um, it was so lovely. Uh, somebody had ordered the book in not knowing, um, like we were sitting at the same table, but oh. they didn't know that it was my book. They work in, um, you know, uh, elementary school and they ordered a bunch of mm. books in and um, they were telling the story of how, I think someone mentioned like the magic phone, they're like, oh, I got that book. And they are telling the story of how um, a little girl, a uh, Somali girl opened it up and saw like the dark skin um, and was just like, they look like me. And, you know, I've, I've watched probably like 20 of these video uh, <laughs> videos of like the little yeah, mermaid, mermaid, you know? <laughs> yeah. And mermaid. it's so wild, like I, just like hearing her say that and about like this book that I wrote yeah. was like, oh my gosh, like, Oh, it was like all the love, you yeah. know, it was just like all the love. And I, I feel so lucky to be able to give that. Um, I also think like there are a lot of like complex ideas in this book. Yeah. And I think that a lot of them are made easier and more digestible by having that visual um, yeah. sort of guide. Like one of the things that comes up in the book, um, I talk about the Arishas who are um, part of the like, 
pantheon of West African gods. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the the main Arisha that shows up in this book is Yamoya, who is the um, the Arisha of surface waters, and Ooh. and so like the one who would watch over us in our travels yeah. across those waters and also ties into the shell. Oh. Um, and uh, other Arishas show up in the images. And one of the things that I learned like only like three years ago um, was that in so many of these like West African religions that existed pre-contact, mm-hmm. um, the like pantheon of gods and like the representation there included so much queerness, like so much mm-hmm. gender diversity. And so it talks a little bit about how their bodies transform however they need. And you'll mm-hmm. see in the images like a lot of really like gender neutral sort of um, representation, which, you know, I told my mom about this like very recently. She she was talking, we were talking about non-binary and my mom is very Catholic. So like (laughs) we do a lot of like, we have a lot of hard conversations. Um, (laughs) Her like super queer polyamorous daughter. Um, (laughs) And um, yeah, she was, she was like, I just don't understand like Mm non-binary. And and so I was trying to explain to her and you know she's like it doesn't just align with like how i what i know to be right i was like explaining to her that you know before there was contact in black culture it was widely accepted yeah. and that that was a disruption in our history mm-hmm. and that um you know if you it, like if you embrace your own ancestry then you can erase that like exactly. um you know that like shame and wrongness mm-hmm. that was like imposed and so that conversation is like a huge conversation, you know, of ancestral healing. But I feel like just in like showing these images, mm-hmm. a little one who maybe hasn't yet encountered that yeah. shame story mm-hmm. gets to like meet them in a different context. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love what you said about like distilling complex ideas down for children's mm-hmm. books because I, that's something we don't, I feel like we don't think about. Mm-hmm. That stories for children, they, they, talk about really big ideas and mm. they're like four. But they're like so smart. They're, their yeah. brains are just like, yes, <laughs> they are. Like, <laughs> and that's why it's so important. We have authors yeah. like you who like show these images and write the stories that you do to show them that like these are the stories that are there for them. And, mm-hmm. and I love that story of like, you know, little girl opening your book. Oh, and yeah. It's yeah. almost like I can imagine it being a bittersweet kind of mm. feeling because we didn't get that. Right. Totally. We didn't see ourselves in these pictures book, but now we are getting to the point where Girls are little boys yeah. are seeing themselves and little it, boys are seeing themselves. It was so amazing. Yeah. I told them it was it made my month to hear that story. <laughs> but also just to, as a quick add-on to what you were saying, you know, there is that grief of not mm-hmm. getting that representation ourselves. Yeah. But um one of the things that was really fun for me in the book is that like the auntie character. Um, who I aspire to be um, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> is actually um, sort of like was inspired by my cousin, um, my older cousin, who was the first representation of queerness that I saw in my uh-huh. life. And she, I remember uh, it was like Thanksgiving dinner. I was must've been like 10 or 11 and she walked in and she had the like woman symbol, like like shaved into the back of her head. And oh. everyone was like, oh, what is she doing that? You know, and I was like, oh my God, cool. Like, and, and so I got to read this before I published it to my cousin yeah. and, and like what showing her like? the picture. She was just like, oh my God, first of all, why does it look like the 90s in this book? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, the best, right? That's how you remember. But you know, yeah. so I, it just also reminded me that like, while we didn't have the representation yeah. in, um, you know, that was like approved by like these sort of sources, <laughs> there's always in queerness, a way that we communicate with each other, you yeah. know, and a way that we like signal to each other, like you're okay. Yeah, which I think is really special, and that's what these books are doing, right, to these kids and mm-hmm. saying you're okay. Mm-hmm. And all that. Um, so I think well, we'll wind down from there. If anybody else has any questions from the audience, or yeah. Yeah. So the question from the audience was, what do you both hope to see in children's media in terms of representation? Mm. I just think for, I mean, for me personally, just more like overt representation, like you were saying in, in animation specifically, I mean, it is very subtle yeah. and, it, and everything, you know, there's like one slight kiss and in, in like a <laughs> background of a Pixar, it's like blurred and everyone likes losing their minds. So I love that. I, when they lose their mind. <laughs> yeah, they do. I would love to write a feature about like, just about that and mm-hmm. not and mm-hmm. people be celebrated. Like, I think that's just so important. I think we're getting there, but it, I think books like this are kind yes. of the stepping stones to that. Course, and yeah. And us sort of existing loudly is, you know, the way to do that. So 
Yeah. Are we gonna get a gay My Little Pony? Oh my god. <laughs> I mean, isn't it already gay though? Yeah. Like, like Tom was thinking of it. Yeah. <laughs> really everywhere. Yeah. Uh, Julie, do you have anything to add about representation that you hope to see more? In yeah, I would just say that I want to hear more from children. Like, I yeah. I think that like, um, kids are so smart and like they have like a wisdom that hasn't been tampered with yeah. yet mm -hmm. um and we could if we would pay attention learn so much from mm -hmm. children um i would love to see like more books written by children for children oh, yeah. you know what i mean because i think like kids have wild imaginations yeah. they yes. you know i've seen like like some um art projects i think over the pandemic where like people were taking like children's uh, images and then like making stuffed animals out of yes, them or like different things like that, life. you know, bringing yeah. them to life. And I feel like I have heard my nibblings tell stories that I'm just like, what is happening now? Like, <laughs> tell me more, you know? So like, I feel like they have, they have so much resource um, for each other, for yeah. themselves. Like so many of the stories that I write are like a bomb for myself. And mm -hmm. I, I want to hear what they um, come okay. up with because I think, we live in a deeply broken world <laughs> and I think we've exhausted a lot of our <laughs> ideas, you know, like I feel like if we dry. listen to some, <laughs> some children, um, not only will we be able to receive something that I think is a lot closer um, to our like inherent goodness than, yeah. than what we can come up with. Um, I also think that like, oh, I had another thing to say about that. What was it? My brain just shut off. <laughs> you know? Um, oh, what was the other thing about listening to children? Um, you know, it's it's gone right now, but maybe it'll come it'll come back to me. Dang, it was a good idea too. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. They do have the Thank you. <laughs> yeah. If it comes back to me before we wrap, yeah. I'll tell you. <laughs> um last chance for any questions or anything from the audience. This has been such a delightful panel, I feel like. It's nice like, and intimate mm -hmm. and very fun. You guys are both amazing readers, mm -hmm. amazing stories. Thank you so much for doing the work you're doing and showing the little kitties what they need to see. Thank, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you again to the audience for joining today. The books, uh, I think you guys are selling them sell yourselves, right? Do you um, I don't actually, I didn't bring copies okay. with me, but That's okay. That's they okay. are all over the place. All over the place. Yeah. <laughs> Straight from Flamingo, Flamingo Rabbit, yeah. um, support indie publishers. Yeah, Stays, I, I, I don't okay. have any, but they're all over, they're the, all world. All over the world. Yeah. I, I, I highly world. encourage all Massey Books. Yeah. Massey Books is a great Massey place to go pick up their yeah. local owned yeah. yeah. bookstore. Absolutely. And, yeah, pick up Stacey's book. It's banned, so you ought to have it. <laughs> oh my gosh, I just remembered what my thing was. Can oh, I say okay. it? Okay. Yeah, really quickly. It. Okay, I think that like, um, when we put like queerness and children in the same sentence, yeah, I, especially from like religious um, mm -hmm. like perspectives, there's a lot of like hostility or like mm -hmm. like distrust or whatever. Yeah. And I think that is because we only look at children through this lens of like what we've imposed on them. And mm -hmm. I think when we hear children's stories, like sometimes they're like, yeah, and then Susie and Jane did it. Like, yeah. you know, like they don't, yeah. it's just like, it, it is not taboo to them. It's just yeah. like right. love. And so to hear those stories come from children, mm -hmm. I think is also evidence of like the queerness that exists in nature. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's, anyway, yeah. that's, that's that awesome. was worth it. That was worth it. <laughs> thank <Like> you. <laughs> thank you again, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the remainder of the festival and thank you for joining us today. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks.